Go ahead. Hi, my name is Dan Winter. I'm a psychophysiologist. I work in biofeedback and have discovered some very interesting things about the electrical nature of emotion. And in the process of doing that, we've been doing uh, frequency signatures or harmonics of the heart at the moments when people feel bliss and joy and compassion. And we've discovered that at moments when people have intense emotions, their heart creates frequency pictures which are a powerful indicator that they're doing something electrical inside their body when they have emotions. And recently with my friend Will here, we've been having these conversations about this Technocalypse television documentary that's kind of sweeping Europe. And we're a little troubled about a certain part of that. It has to do with the way in which they seem to be urging you to consider using uh, little microchips and other ways to uh, include machinery as part of biology. And they're kind of saying, well, there's nothing sacred about the shape of the body and the electric electricity of the heart, and machines can be doing this better. And so then we're actually stuck in the middle of something of a quandary because my work on emotion has suggested to me that we could actually answer a profound question about what is the purpose of DNA in an entirely new way, which gives us a completely different view of what we should be doing with the relationship of technology to biological substances. So our little fun answer to this question of what is the purpose of DNA is very brief. It's called Bliss and the Magnetic X, and that's really the subject of our little story today. And it has to do with this idea that we believe we've discovered some um, secrets, some visions to exactly how human passionate bliss-related emotion actually gets into the genetic material. And therefore, emotion's ability to program and shape, and we're going to talk about braid the DNA, has everything to do with the genetic material having been in this profound shape which nature put it in. And if we go messing in there with this genetic engineering and all these chips in your cells, we stand to actually affect dramatically whether or not emotion can continue to program DNA. So in order to tell you this story, I'm going to show you some pictures of what we're calling the Magnetic X Generation. And it's kind of play on words from this old story of there's this, you know, we had this post-World War II generation, the baby boom, and then there was the X generation. And the notion here is that if you feel enough bliss, it has an effect on your DNA, and we'll see that's been measured. So your DNA becomes a magnetic X. It's kind of a fun notion. So here are the pictures. First we look at this idea that, in fact, the X chromosome, which sort of, sort of determines what it is that makes woman versus man, actually has a magnetic field around it. This field is based on the geometry of the microtubules at the moment of cell meiosis or mitosis, cell division. And so you see that really this division of the, the DNA, the cell division moment of this living cell, is dependent on whether the X chromosome is literally, in a sense, magnetic. So the timing of cell replication, which when it's orderly it's not cancer, and when it's disorderly it is cancer, is dependent upon a magnetic field to align the microtubules and the DNA in this lovely ritual dance. So if the magnetic field's messed up, obviously the timing of cell division is going to be messed up. So we need to understand where does the magnetic field around DNA come from. This is a picture from the early, and you can even zoom in right here. This is the early x-ray photographs of DNA when they first tried to model genetic material as having a double helix. The Watson and Crick moment was when they were in, able to interpret this magnetic X. They made an X-ray photograph. They said, oh, the only way you could cast an X-ray shadow of the DNA protein was to, ha to account for that. It had to be a double helix. So DNA as a double helix was first discovered specifically because, literally, the X-ray shadow of DNA was an X. <laughs> it's a magnetic X. And we're going to see that has meaning in terms of what's squirting out of the places where the DNA crosses itself. You know, crosses itself, 
sort of makes a blessing? Well, the cross on the cross turns out to be the mechanism of braiding, which we'll see in a minute, may in fact be emotion-induced. So what we're getting to here is there might be a reason not to mess with the spacing between the codons of your DNA. And while all these biologists who are hacking up your DNA in this genetic engineering call it junk DNA, they're affecting the spacing which affects whether this X cross in your DNA works to make a good harmonic squirt gun, a harmonic cascade, a way of laddering the frequencies. So let's look at some more of the pictures. The idea is that in the genetic material you have a nest of magnetic fields where each of the magnetic fields is like a donut inside a donut. And when the donuts or field effects nest properly in the DNA, then they make this X, which we'll see can actually project harmonics out through the throat of the X. And this becomes a way later we can talk about how DNA gets a field effect that goes faster than light. But let's just take another little simple picture here of how the braiding works. This is like what, how you make a ponytail in your DNA. So the point is, what, what the scientists who have been talking about your DNA may have been forgetting here is the difference between the short wave, which is this helix, versus this wave on the wave of the wave on the wave. So you get this braiding going on where you're going down the throat, where when finally you see this actual X in your DNA, what's actually happened is there's been a braid on the braid of the braid of the braid. And you have this very long wave now superposed in your DNA. Let's tell that story for a second, and we're going to cut to a little movie here. In order to understand our movie, we need to understand what it feels like to look down DNA as a slinky from the top. And this is the picture from New Scientist magazine, where it shows that the way genetic material looks like from the top is a ten-sided figure. Notice it looks like you have a little kind of a black hole or a linear accelerator or maybe a squirt gun down the center. So now we can play our little movie. Here's another view of the top down looking into that ratcheted dodecahedra. And as that dodecahedron ratchets down, we see that the double helix in your genetic material is a wavelength here, which is this wavelength here is in the ultraviolet spectra, okay? So it's literally a high quality ultraviolet or blue light. Later we're going to call it blue fire. But you see that we've drawn in the double helix here as a blue and purple helix, okay? And so that helix is a short wave in your DNA. But what the genetic engineers may have forgotten is they're all excited that they now understand the letters but they don't understand how the words and the syntax requires a phrase within a sentence, within a paragraph, within a book. And it's that context richness or context embedding which is the braid on your DNA. And you see how this is a braid of the short wave on the long wave? So the information that's in your DNA actually has these waves here which are very long waves, which is a wave on a wave on a wave on a wave waving. That's called super looping, and that's actually a picture of how harmonics nest in, say, things like your heart, where, for example, in your heartbeat, you have your heart, you have your heart beat as a wave, and then you have your heart rate as a wave, and then you have your breath as a longer wave yet, so you have a wave on a wave waving, and that's the process of embedding and the embedding or nesting of how short waves can nest inside of long waves where the interference between them is all constructive is based on something called perfect nesting or perfect branching which turns out to be exactly in mother nature what she calls phi low taxes and that's how leaves branch in these trees around us, in the lovely trees, the way the branch happens is that this branch with related, re relationship to this branch chooses the place to unfurl so that the geometry of the leaf structure actually solves the problem of perfect sharing. 
So you got this one leaf that says, oh, I need to share the light so that there's maximum exposure, minimum superposition.